is the second most popular royal act, if you like. He's the member of the royal family that most people would say, I'd like to have a drink with him. A young royal who has stood out from the rest of the family. Harry is very accessible. He's very cheeky, he's very funny. He plays around with the press and he's very naughty and I think Britain adores him. But behind the smiles, Prince Harry has had to face unique difficulties. From his parents' very public marriage breakdown. Harry was very often devastated by what was so public. To losing his mother. He said that no child should ever have been made to do what he did. And struggling to find a role for himself. On the right! Quick! March! Tonight, royal experts and insiders lift the lid on Prince Harry's inner turmoil. If you look back over his life, you can see moments where his troubling side has come to the fore. And we reveal how the problems of his past led him to his present path. Harry blames the media for the death of his mother. He was determined that they wouldn't do for Meghan what they did for Diana. Living a life of privilege are some of Harry's issues first world problems. Or has he been expected to suffer in silence in an institution famous for keeping a stiff upper lip? I think he's very warm, I think he's very fun-loving, but I think he's also quite troubled and open about that. He is quite conflicted when it comes to balancing his private and public life, and really always has been. He said he wants to be ordinary. He can't be ordinary, but he is a member of the royal family. The 15th of September, 1984. The nation was at fever pitch for the birth of Prince Charles and Princess Diana's second child. Britain loved the birth of a royal baby. Charles and Diana were hugely popular, and everybody wanted to see whether they were going to have a little girl or a little boy. The crowds were gathering outside the hospital, outside the gates of Buckingham Palace, and they wanted to see who was going to be on the tea towel. I was christened in this. Mm. Looks remarkably well, despite it. From the beginning, the spotlight was on the young Prince Harry. For Diana to have another child in fairly swift succession was, of course, joyous. And then when the child grew up and had ginger hair, and I think even from an early age has been quite cheeky with photographers and seemed to be quite contrasted to William in his temperament, there was, of course, excitement about him. <laughs> When it comes to dealing with the press, Prince Harry has a style all of his own. Harry sticking his tongue out at one of the sort of stuffed shirt automatons. Here's a role who seems to have a lot of personality, even as a little child. Some labelled it as cheeky, some as rude. Most people thought it was delightful. It was quite endearing when he was a young boy, really came to colour the way his views of the press were shaped. Harry's role in the royal family wasn't just a brother for William and another son for Charles and Diana. On paper, Prince Harry's start in life was incredibly privileged, incredibly lucky. But actually, in reality, being born as the younger brother of the future King of England is a very difficult position to be born into. Of course, they're known rather unkindly as the spare. I think being the spare to the heir is a role that inherently has problems attached with it. You know, if you look at the heir, if you look at Prince William, his role has always been defined. What he's going to do has always been clearly outlined. Harry, like spares historically in the royal family, has had to find a role for himself. To some, Prince Harry grew up in the shadow of a brother destined for the throne. He was always less than his brother. The late Queen Mother used to invite Prince William over for tea and talk to him about his future and not invite Prince Harry. The Queen Mother always made sure that Prince William was seated in a prominent seat next to her, and Harry never was. Diana would take the two boys to Highgrove in Gloucestershire. And on this particular occasion, Diana was driving. I was sat in the front, William and Harry in the back. You know, they clearly got off to a bad start because they were both arguing before we even left. Harry out of nowhere just said, William, you know, one day you'll be king, I won't, it doesn't matter, therefore I can do what I like. You can take that comment two ways. It can indicate envy, if you like, that William's got this great future as king, but also there's an element of I'm free, I'm going to be able to choose my own role in life. While the young princes may have been aware of their unequal positions, their parents 
Elizabeth were determined to raise them the same way. Diana was very conscious that she wanted the palace to treat the boys equally and to give Harry as many opportunities that were afforded to William. You know, Diana was very fair about how she treated them. There were no favourites as I saw it. Prince Charles shared Diana's concerns about making sure the boys shared things in their early years, but certainly other more senior members of the family were privately would say, well, this is nonsense. I mean, William is the future. All our efforts must go into educating William. It was William who the Queen would invite for lessons in kingship, if you like, when he was at Eton and she was at Windsor Castle. But while Charles and Diana tried hard to keep their sons happy, their own relationship faltered and ultimately failed. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with Many problems that many people in the West have all the time in growing up in a broken home, but his broken home was exposed on a most extraordinary scale. The entire planet tuned in to learn every detail about the Charles and Diana separation and divorce, and inevitably the focus on Harry and William followed. Harry was very often devastated by what was so public. He couldn't understand why his mother would wish to be so public with so much of her life. Harry was always the baby of the family, and whether it was at school or whether at home, every effort was made to shield him from the newspaper headlines and protect him from his parents, who really, by that stage, were in a pretty bad way. The War of the Waleses saw Charles and Diana's separation and divorce play out on the front pages and to TV audiences of millions. For the children to hear both parents to come on television at separate times, to admit to having affairs and to admit to how unhappy they both were when these kids were at boarding school. Can you imagine how cringe-making it must have been for them? Highly embarrassing. And I don't think that makes them secure. In later years, Harry would admit his parents' divorce left him feeling like he didn't spend enough time with either of them. I think Harry found it quite difficult kind of being shared between parents and spending some time at Kensington Palace with Princess Diana and then going to Clarence House and then to Highgrove, his father's property in Gloucestershire. And this sense that he didn't really have a permanent home was difficult for him. The divorce was finalised in 1996. A year later came a far bigger blow for the royals, and especially for Harry, at the age of just 12. We have reports from Paris the Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. Harry really did feel the loss of his mother. Being the youngest, he was, as much as William was close to his mother, he was probably a little bit closer. It's incredibly difficult to lose your mother at such a tender age, especially if you're in the public eye. And I think that Harry's had a unique set of circumstances to cope with. Less than a week after Diana died, her funeral was watched around the world by around two and a half billion people. I don't think anyone will ever forget the sight of Harry walking behind his mother's coffin. So small, so young, so grief-stricken. This is part of being royal. This is their duty. They might not necessarily agree with it, but this is what it was, and that must have been very different. On a public sleeve, and they were incredibly brave in, in the way they presented themselves. All around them, people were caterwauling, weeping, wailing, and anybody hearing that would, would break down, but no, they didn't. Which was actually very selfish of most people, because somewhere in amongst all that national outpouring of grief, the private grief of the boys got lost. Ever since Diana's death, Harry has been in no doubt about who he blames for the tragedy. I think it was inevitable that Harry blamed the press for the death of his mother. In fact, it was much more grey. There were a lot of photographers outside the Ritz Hotel, but both Diana and Dodie chose to go out that evening. Being part of this family in this role, in this job, every single time, I see a camera every single time I hear a click, every single time I see a flash, it takes me straight back. So in that respect, it's, it's, the, it's the worst reminder of her life as opposed to the best. For two decades, Harry said very little about losing his mother. But in recent years, he has lifted the lid on the emotional turmoil he's been experiencing. 
He said that no child should ever have been made to do what he did. The experience of that, the trauma of losing his mother, has culminated in years of personal crises for the prince, something that he's struggled with in adulthood. And I think having spoken so openly and courageously about the impact that losing his mother had on him, we now do have some understanding on just how much that has shaped him. Harry revealed he had been seeing a mental health professional to help him with his grief. It was a surprise when Harry came out and said he'd had these mental welfare problems. The fact that he sought help, treatment, we learned that it was William who had not forced him, but said, you've really got to get some help here. We also learned that he'd um, taken up boxing to try and control his aggression, and the aggression was a consequence of his mourning, and he was still dealing with his grief over his mother's death. But it would take nearly two decades for Harry to seek help. In the years after Diana's death, the young prince would deal with his troubles in a very different way. The sadness and the grief would make him behave in a very inappropriate way. He had problems with excessive drinking and also problems with drugs. By the early 2000s, Prince Harry was privately mourning the loss of his mother. Prince Harry told me that for years he buried his head in the sand and he thought, if I don't think about her, I won't get upset. And he did this. He was gaining a reputation. The party prince, the playboy prince, the hard drinking prince. The first time I ever met Prince Harry, he was at a nightclub. It was the year of his A-levels. He was meant to be at home revising, and he was at the Kensington Roof Gardens, knocking back vodka shots, smoking Marlboro Lights, surrounded by a group of gorgeous blondes. That was Prince Harry. Harry's wilder side had emerged even before reaching his A-levels. A newspaper had been passed details about Harry drinking, being involved in lock-ins in local pubs, and smoking cannabis on occasions too. You can really understand how a lonely, privileged, unhappy prince would end up drinking and smoking and taking cannabis to fill those hours and to hang out with people who he thought really liked or even loved him. 16-year-old Harry was made to visit a drug rehabilitation clinic by Prince Charles to educate him on what could happen if he didn't change his ways. But just a few years later, it wasn't country pubs Harry was visiting. There had been a series of photographs of Prince Harry falling out of nightclubs late at night with various girls and all the rest of it. He was clearly in party mode. In 2004, Harry had an altercation with a photographer while leaving a West End nightclub. There are two sides to that story. On one hand, the photographer saying that Harry lunged at him, possibly after a few beers, and the palace saying that the photographer had knocked him with his camera. Was this kind of behaviour just part of growing up? Or did his troubles run deeper? Harry's naughtiness was sometimes just boyish, but other times was really a symptom of his deep grief. It was outlets for his despair, I think. Everything he did was always going to be examined with microscopic detail. He couldn't, in other words, get away with the kind of things that many of his teenage friends could. It was obviously also storing up that sense of resentment that Harry came to have against the media. No one's making judgments, it's just, you're just being reported. And actually, some of this has helped to fuel your popularity. People love a royal rebel at the end of the day. Regardless of public opinion, Harry has been open about his feelings towards the media. He admitted to reading coverage about himself when he turned 21. They stop up something and I still read them. Why, I do not know, but I have to read them just for peace of mind, just to know what they've written and to see who, who wrote it and see who took the photographs, you know, write that down now for later. But there was one newspaper report about Harry's behaviour that upset many others. In 2005, while attending a costume party, Harry wore a swastika armband. That was an episode that happened when he was fully protected by the royal machine, and yet it still happened. You know, it was a grave error of judgement, and one wonders why there wasn't someone looking out for him and telling him, actually, it's quite unfair at the time, and I still think it was quite unfair. It was clearly not a political statement. It was clearly a stupid teenager doing a very stupid thing, thinking it was funny. Harry apologised for it. He said it was something that he regretted. It happened on the eve of him joining Sandhurst. The Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. In May 2005, Harry spent nearly a year here training to be an officer 
cadet in the army, something he'd wanted for a long time. One of the things that we saw very much with Harry growing up was the fact that he absolutely adored the military. I remember him as a five-year-old strutting up and down the road at Kensington Palace in army fatigues. Harry excelled in his training and was commissioned as an army officer in April 2006. I think Harry found purpose in the army. I think he found safety in the army, ironically, because of course it wasn't safe, but I think he found emotional safety in the army. The army allowed Harry to feel normal. That's what he wanted. It's completely normal, it's as normal as it's going to get. I mean, I'm one of the guys, I don't get treated any differently. Even though Harry felt normal in the army, the rest of the world couldn't forget he was a royal. And that brought problems. When he was told he couldn't serve on the front line, he was absolutely furious and wanted to be treated like any other soldier. I have decided today that Prince Harry will not deploy as a troop leader with his squadron. There was a U-turn on a decision to deploy Harry to Iraq in 2007 over safety fears. I joined the army unless I thought I was going to. Um, simple as that. Um, if, if they said, no, you can't go front line, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through Sandhurst and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am now because the last thing I want to do is have my soldiers sent away to Iraq or wherever like that and for me to be held back home twiddling my thumbs thinking, what about David, what about Derek? At that time, Everyone else was going to Iraq, and he felt he should too, and it, it was enormously frustrating for him. Eventually, Harry was allowed to serve in combat zones. In 2008, it was revealed that he had been deployed to Afghanistan. The day he flew out, he was ecstatic, really. He said that being in theater in Afghanistan, you know, something that most people would find, frankly, terrifying, was as normal as he was ever going to get, and he loved it for that reason. But his time on active duty was short-lived. A media blackout was imposed on Harry's posting for his protection until an Australian magazine revealed where he was and he was forced to leave. He'd had his opportunity in Afghanistan cut short. He could see which way the wind was blowing. It was unlikely he'd get another opportunity unless he could do something different. So he put himself through some really tough and this allowed him to have a second bite at the cherry and to go back out there. On his second deployment, the media were allowed much more access to Harry. Not that he was happy about it. And so what, and what do you think the public perception of, of Harry is? Um, I don't know, it fluctuates. It depends on what the media want to write, I suppose. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm out here doing a job and, and I really enjoy it. Um, I never wanted you guys to be out here, but um, there was an agreement made um, to invite you out on the on the, on the, on the deal that you, that the media didn't speculate before my, my deployment. That's the only reason you guys are out here. Harry may not have wanted the cameras there, but it did give the world a chance to see him in his element. If you speak to anybody in the military, they will always say he was absolutely fantastic. Being dragged away from my guys, it just, I think it was all done. It, it wasn't done in the wrong way, but it was just, This was Harry doing what he did extremely well, but also doing what he was always keen on doing. In January 2013, Harry returned to the UK after a successful deployment, but there were questions over what was next for him. Because of who he was, it was no longer possible for him to pursue that career. And then what happens? He's left really without a job without a purpose. He was doing something he felt comfortable with. The army and anybody who has made a career in the army will tell you military is family and he felt at home. There was camaraderie and by the time he got out he was a little bit lost because he really didn't know what to do and that goes winds back to the spare. There is no defined role for that spare. Because he certainly wouldn't contemplate an army desk job. He certainly he was not the type of person who would fit in to that and Therefore, there was a huge question mark, what would he do next? In April 2011, the world watched as the future king of the United Kingdom married his queen. Best man Prince Harry was by his brother's side as William officially settled down. Uh, Roger, before 30 seconds, and I request flares and as low as possible. But in between his army tours, was Harry ready 
the same thing. They're still talking, Simon. Or did he still have some growing up to do? The Americans arrived, all is well in the Empire. <laughs> it didn't seem then that he was yet quite ready to settle down. Oh, oh there it is. Yes, Harry was a prince, but he was also a lad who wanted to go out and have some fun. 2012. This hotel, however, it is most unwise to play strip pool. According to the advertisement, what goes on here stays here. In Harry's case, it certainly didn't. Once again, Harry was front page news for all the wrong reasons. For some, it was Harry the lovable rogue. The tabloids ran the images of him basically stark naked, <laughs> covering his crown jewels, I think. There was no wrongdoing there. It was a bit of harmless fun. And what's been interesting about Harry is, actually, quite a few of these episodes have endeared him to the public even more. But Harry is still struggling to reconcile the role he had been given at birth and the man he was becoming. I probably let myself down, let my family down, let other people down, but at the end of the day, you know, I was, I was in a private area and I sh there should be a certain amount of pri privacy that one should expect. Um, but, you know, it was probably a classic example of me probably being too much on me and, and not enough Prince, um, is, is a simple case of that. After Harry's second tour of Afghanistan, he found a way to combine being a Prince with his passion for the military. Your stories move, inspire and humble us. You prove that anything is possible if you have the will. Welcome to the Games. Welcome to Invictus. He founded the Invictus Games, helping disabled and wounded men and women from the services. Invictus was also a way for Harry to address his own troubles. As Angela Levin discovered when she interviewed the Prince. I said, well, my first question, Your Highness, is that I've seen you on so many occasions with people who are damaged, with the young, teenagers, ex-servicemen and women, and you are completely brilliant with them. You know what to say and the way to say it. And I wondered whether you were using these occasions to also help yourself with your own mental health issues. Absolute silence. And I thought, help, I'm going to be thrown out. See that ages and then he said that's a really big question silence you know, uh, and he said you're right of course he felt that he was helping others who were probably suffering the same as he was because those in the Invictus games they're also suffering this was Harry's way undoubtedly of continuing links with the military which he wouldn't do from a desk job but wanted to do in the wider world following his mother's footsteps as well for charity activities. Harry had created an outlet that gave him a purpose and allowed him to help others. But what about his private life? His relationship with his brother was always close. Every year we get closer and we've even resorted to hugging each other now after not seeing each other for a long period of time. Um, but he talked about anything and we understand each other and we give each other support and everything's fine. They were two peas in a pod. They looked out for each other. The brothers not lovers. There's a difference. For some, Harry gaining a sister-in-law highlighted the need for him to move on and find his own partner. Inevitably, there was sort of a little bit of gentle mockery about him as a sort of a, the third person in the marriage um, of William and Kate on this occasion, of course, because they, they were so close, they, they did things together. There's just an awkwardness to that scenario, a couple trying to carve their own path as newlyweds and then a prince who's got a great deal to offer and which takes precedence and who's more popular when it comes to the press and how does that work in tandem. So I think there was always friction in that regard with the three of them. I think what changed things for Harry was William having his own children and Harry looking on at Kensington Palace where they were neighbours and thinking that he probably wanted that for himself. It's fantastic to have a, another addition to the family. I only hope my brother knows how expensive my uh, baby sitting charges are. It was always inevitable that Harry was going to want to live his own life. Aww, put some effort in. It's, Come it's on. the wizard, never the wand. <laughs> <laughs> but for Harry, finding a princess of his own would prove difficult. The first love, Chelsea Davy, um, the girl that he met in South Africa, who he fell head over heels in love with, she had eight years to look into the goldfish bowl of royalty. 
and to realise absolutely this wasn't the life for her. He lost Chelsea because she didn't like to be in the spotlight. Harry was disappointed, but he was very much younger and this was probably his first love and probably a love that was not going to go anywhere. That was swiftly followed by a relationship with, with Cresta Bonus, um, who uh, was a budding actress. And she, too, didn't like the idea of media intrusion. Uh, the media's got a knack of destroying relationships, and she didn't like media intrusion and really did want to pursue her acting career, and she walked away. For years, Harry was troubled by his position and the scrutiny that came with it, which would scare women away. And it's quite sad when he's one of the world's most eligible bachelors, and at the same time not seeming to be able to find somebody who will take on the job of being in the public eye. There is this sense that they loved him but didn't love the idea of being royal. Then Meghan Markle entered Harry's life, offering him a genuine chance at happiness. After rumours of a relationship, the pair appeared in public together for the first time in September 2000. Different in many ways. She had a degree of fame and had lived through that herself. She was incredibly accomplished as a public performer, as an actress. It gave her great confidence. She seemed incredibly secure in herself, and she was that much older than, than these girls uh, that had gone before. She'd also, of course, been married, um, which uh, added an entirely different layer to the relationship. Good grief, you know, Prince Harry is punching above his weight here. There's this amazingly glamorous American actress. When I walked into that room and saw her, and there she was sitting there, I was like, OK, well, I really have to up, up my game here. <laughs> it was almost as if she was a ready-made royal and therefore a perfect fit for him. Oh. In this strong, striking, confident woman, there was actually someone who was very capable of handling the pressure and the scrutiny of being in the public eye. That was something that neither of his two girlfriends had been willing to take on. But the scrutiny would soon affect Prince Harry and his new girlfriend. He issued an unprecedented statement saying, Meghan Markle has been subject to a wave of abuse and harassment. I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that, even though we yeah, knew I, that it would be. You know, I tried to, I tried, I tried to warn, I tried to warn you as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But I think both of us were totally surprised by the, the reaction after the first five, six months of what we had to ourselves. You could see that the old thorny issue of Harry's relationship with the press was raising its head again. Quite a lot of the press was very, very charged about her background, headlines like straight out of Compton and all of this kind of thing. There was quite an unpleasant tinge to it. There has been some very negative publicity given, and some of it marginally racist, which is unacceptable. Not everything that was troubling Prince Harry was in print or written by journalists. Horrible, horrible stuff on social media, and I'm sure they weren't scrolling through it all, all the time, but y you will see the stuff. You know, they're modern young royals. Of course they're going to be on social media. <laughs> this time, though, the relationship survived. Harry asked Meghan to marry him. What were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Trying to roast chicken. <laughs> Trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. Having watched Harry grow up, the public saw this as the moment to put his past behind him. They wanted Harry to be happy. They Harry and they wanted him to be content and find the right person. Well, I think that the country were overwhelmed with happiness for Harry. Heartbreaking confessions about how upset he'd been and how he'd struggled with demons for years, uh, coming to terms with the grief of the loss of his mother. And then he should find this remarkable young woman who had such a different background from him, whom he was so clearly in love with. But was this the beginning? a fairy tale or the start of another difficult chapter for the already troubled prince. Things were said and done in the run-up to the wedding that both sides regret but had caused irreparable damage. On the 19th of May 2018, all eyes were on St George's Chapel in Windsor. 
The wedding day was wonderful. Meghan looked beautiful in her dress. Harry couldn't have looked happier. The ceremony itself was so vibrant. It was so new. It was so different. It was so unique to the two of them. And I think it was the start of something very, very happy and very, very special. Nobody can deny that the wedding day itself was sparkling. It was magic. It was like Disneyland. But not long after, Harry was once again facing familiar troubles with the press. The wheels started to come off amid suggestions that the couple had been a bit difficult over the planning of the wedding and that demands were being made that perhaps weren't quite in proportion with their place in the royal pecking order. He said before the wedding what Meghan wants, Meghan gets, and I think he defers to her a great deal. She's a very confident, articulate woman who's done very well for herself, but I think she has no idea of the sense of duty, which is understandable because she's never been a member of the royal family, but she won't be confined by protocol. The level of perceived criticism against Meghan is something many say has had a profound effect on Harry. He saw echoes of what had happened with his own mother and thought, I'm going to speak out about it. And I know a lot of the press were very, very angry about this. Lots of people were saying, how dare he have the temerity to break this code that you would never, ever complain. But unlike other members of his family, Harry has not always observed the royal code of silence. After the birth of his and Meghan's son, Archie, he became even more defiant. I will always protect my family, and now I have a family to protect. Everything that, everything that she went through and what happened to her is incredibly raw every single day, and that's not being paranoid, that's just me not wanting a repeat of, of the past. Um, rather be it a husband, be it anyone, you'd, do, you'd probably do, be doing exactly what, I, what, what I'm doing as well. I think Harry fears that there will be parallels between his own relationship and, and that of his, his mother, and he's, he's very keen to protect Meghan and Archie. I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. Harry is so protective of Meghan of his mother and this idea that he doesn't want any other woman in his life going through what Diana went through. The trouble is with that is he has rewritten history somewhat because although there was undoubtedly a hounding of Diana, there was also a manipulation of the press. In the eyes of some, criticising the press for criticising them hasn't always been warranted. Meghan flew to New York for a baby shower. Now, nothing wrong with going to a baby shower. That's what Americans do. We don't do it so often in, in the UK. But she flew over private What's wrong with the commercial jet? They went to Ibiza and the south of France in private jets. What's wrong with commercial flights? And that's when they were getting criticized because they'd been preaching climate change. They'd been preaching the environment. They'd been preaching global warming and doing all the things that they shouldn't be doing. Everybody deserves a critical word written about them. Nobody should be above reproach. The press accused them of hypocrisy. And there's no question also that they weren't, it seemed, listening to advice paying much attention to precedent. All of this made the atmosphere very unhappy. While the press levelled criticism in public, behind palace walls, Harry was allegedly facing troubles of a much more private nature. One of the things that unquestionably adversely affected the relations between Harry and William, who were so close for so many years, was a series of rumours after the wedding William expressed doubts to Harry as to whether or not he was too quick in being engaged to Meghan. There was a brotherly discussion, which I think was voiced out of concern from William, but was misinterpreted as a lack of support. Things were said and done in the run-up to the wedding that both sides regret, but had caused irreparable damage. Was Harry losing the one person he could trust, the brother he was so close to throughout the troubles of his childhood? There are also clearly unresolved issues and a distance between the two brothers that, that has never been there before. In 2019, the brothers split their royal households and later in the year, Harry even addressed the rumours of a rift. Inevitably, you know, stuff, um, stuff happened. <laughs>
palaces and courtiers will pan out. The Queen has made it very clear that she would always welcome him back, and the arrangements where they have to draw titles and not receive the sovereign grant and all these restrictions are only for a year and after that it's going to be looked at again. So they're really under the watchful eye of the royal family for the first year, which they probably don't like at all. The future for Harry and Meghan poses many questions. Will they be free to speak their mind? Recently, Harry was caught off guard by Russian comedians in a prank phone call in which he spoke candidly, unaware it was a hoax. I don't mind saying this to you guys. Um, I think the mere fact that Donald Trump is, is pushing the, the coal industry so big in America, um, he, he has blood on his hands because the, the, the effect that that has on the climate and on the island nations far, far away, again, out of sight, out of mind. I think he's definitely going to be off the, the leash. I mean, I don't get the impression he's going to be sort of gratuitously, you know, confessing all, but there will come a point where I think the, the lid will get lifted on, on this whole saga. Despite his popularity with the British public, Harry has long been a troubled prince. Will his dramatic break from the royal family finally allow him the freedom to start a new life and leave his troubles behind? Maybe it'll work for them. Uh, maybe he'll, he'll, he'll be a much more relaxed and a happier man. They will be missed in the UK, and I just hope they find themselves and they are equally as successful as they have been. There is a great sense of loss that this is Britain's loss, this is the royal family's loss at the end of the day, and it's North America's gain.